Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Tuesday, March 22nd. We are here live, and it is time for the Power Hour today. We're going to open those phone lines right now. If you're listening on the stream, jump in and join us quickly, 855 950 Three eight three five. That's the number to join us. We will be uh, bringing in Pete and Ethan here in just a minute, and I think Bruce might be joining us a little later. This week, uh, a little hectic for everybody getting ready to head down to the Mid-America Truck Show. I will probably be rolling out of here, well, I don't know when, um, but it's we're close, so uh, I'm sure Pittsburgh Power is working on that, too. We'll get them in here in just a little bit. Um, while we're waiting, calls are starting to come in. That's awesome. Keep them coming. Phone lines will get busy, so go ahead and dial us. It is a maintenance free for all today. If you have a question, a comment, a topic around, well, almost anything to do with your truck, specs, fuel mileage, performance, modifications, upgrades, troubleshooting, emissions, electronics, general repairs, anything you've got going on with your truck, pick up the phone and join us. Calls are starting to come in, so line them up, 855-950-3835. We'll get to those calls here in a little bit. Uh, The big news, obviously, still is the economy, inflation, fuel prices, I have never seen anything like the fuel price right now, not just being high, but being crazy volatile. And when we keep hearing about these price changes, it's going to go up this much, it's going to go down this much, that's not making it to the pump. And it's changing and reversing so fast that sometimes we never see it reflected in the pump. By the time one raise starts to catch up, another drop kicks in. Um, This is interesting. We just had, I got to get back to some of these numbers because they're hard to keep my head around. So we had a a pretty big drop in retail, pretty big, um, 11, almost 12 cents a gallon on Monday. Um, Based on the numbers we've been hearing, it doesn't seem like it's that big, but a 12 cent drop That's the biggest one-week decline in over seven years. And yet, after that big decline, the the national average price, $5.13 a gallon, is the second highest price in history. The only week higher was the week before. That was $5.25. So we have the biggest drop ever, well, in seven years, which is a long time, and we're still at the second highest price ever. Um, the futures on, what was this, just diesel or, yeah, the futures dropped $1.40 a gallon. Um, wholesale prices dropped a lot between the 9th and the 15th. Um, but then we saw increases again of $0.77 cents a gallon. Uh, On Monday, just this past Monday, low sulfur diesel specifically, we can get down to the individual prices on um, different fuels themselves. We can look at a barrel of oil, then we can drill right down to the individual fuels. And on Monday, ultra low sulfur on the wholesale market was up 21 cents again. Um, We haven't seen some of these numbers since 2014. That would be eight years almost. Um, So what they're saying now is about the only thing that will bring the market back into balance. Now, we don't even know a price it would settle in, but the only thing that's going to bring the market back to balance, and this is kind of scary, something I've never even really heard this term before, demand destruction. They think we need to just cut demand, but how do you do that? 
people need this fuel. Obviously, nobody is going out and buying fuel at this price that they don't need. Trucks, for sure, diesel is, is we could call it the working fuel. Now, in a lot of other countries, diesel is far more common in you know, passenger vehicles. But in this country, diesel, for the most part, other than um, some dually pickups and some pickup trucks, diesels, a couple other vehicles, just not that many on the market. Diesel here is a working fuel. So how do we cut demand for a working fuel? And if we don't cut demand, they're saying this isn't going to stop. Well, the only way I know of to cut demand, we're not going to do it on purpose, but these kinds of prices and this kind of inflation will just tank the economy. And when the economy tanks, then there'll be less demand for diesel. That's not a good end to this. What we need to see, and obviously this administration just isn't interested, we don't need to crush demand. We need to pump more oil. How difficult is this? We have it. We have access to it. But everything about this administration has said no to oil. And then we wonder how we got here. They, I'm not going to get too political, but just like for a year or two, they said defund the police. Now we have crime everywhere. And they're saying, oh, we didn't say that. When we say you trampled on any kind of oil production, they say, oh, no, we didn't say that. We didn't do that. Well, yeah, you did. We have all the videos, but yet they say that. And now we're saying the only way to stop this is to crush demand. The only way I know of to do that is to basically kill our economy. And every day it looks more and more like that's what we're headed for here. All right. It is time. I believe we've got um, Pete and Ethan with us, and it looks like – Ethan, you're going to be up first today, so welcome back. Oh, let me hit the button twice that time. There we go. Ethan, welcome. As always, Kevin, good to be here. So uh, what's new and exciting since I – well, I'm pretty sure there's not much new and exciting because I left. So – Yeah, that that was kind of the peak there, and then, you know, everything else just kind of flies down a little bit. Yeah. So I do have to tell you, though, this is the first – power hour since we uh, played around with the coach a little bit too yes Um, and by the way how did how did that trip go so far it is it's almost hard to describe so a couple things we know just before the tune the exhaust was a mess we I can't even imagine how much back pressure this thing had and we had a huge boost leak how long did it take in man hours to get to that boost leak though that was just crazy. I, there were three people back there, it seemed like, for two days. Yeah, it, it's not always easy on some applications, but again, you know, efficiency is efficiency, and it, it'll pay for itself repairing it. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, here's part of the problem. For a lot of these coaches, it doesn't. That's why these things almost never get fixed. You look at a couple things, and people will go, well, I only have you know, 40,000 miles on my C13 in a coach or a Cummins Signature 600. Well, in the trucking world, that's two months. I mean, we're we're just, we haven't even started using the truck yet, so you don't even think about stuff that might need repaired. But over time, I mean, I got thinking about this. Why didn't I throw a damper on it while I was there? It's 15 years old. Yeah, and that's one thought. I know the mileage is still less than what, you know, we always say there too, though. Right. So I think I remember Bruce saying we almost never deal with it on trucks. I thought it was like five years, or maybe it was 10 if it's just sitting and doesn't have high mileage. I want to say around 10, but that's uh, Bruce will have the exact answer on that one. Yeah, I remember him talking about that. So this one probably needs that. You know, for most people, though, if you had to pull this into an RV shop and have the kind of engine work done that you guys just did, first off, most engine shops, especially in the RV world, wouldn't even know what a boost leak is. I mean, they wouldn't even know to check it. They don't check charger coolers. They don't pressure test the system. We know how bad that is on trucks, even. So 
I could just about guess every coach out there has a huge boost leak and they just deal with it. Like, it's yeah. like there, but so what? Yeah, we even had to come up with a creative method to do yours because of the way it was set up. Um, you know, normally we just go straight to the turbocharger, but that's not so easy on yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they creativity. Tried. <laughs> yeah, they tried getting to it from everywhere. The bottom, both sides, the front, through the wheel well, it just without tearing the bedroom apart. There's just no way to work on most of this engine. And I have a feeling there's a lot of these things running around that could really benefit from fixing those kinds of things. But they don't put enough miles on them. It would be really expensive when you compare it to what it takes to fix these things on a truck. Where you open the hood, you have access somewhat. I mean, I know it's harder than it used to be, but you still have access to most of that stuff fairly easy. So the exhaust, that one would have been an easy one. Um, I don't know why I didn't think of it. You were the first one that looked at it and said, hey, what are we doing with that thing on here? <laughs> um, so just those two things alone, when I first took it out on the first test drive before we tuned it, you guys have a great test right there. You get down to the bottom of that hill, and you got to start from a dead stop up a pretty decent climb. I mean, I would venture to say that hill is 7%. Yeah, it's a, a pretty good one. And, and if we would have kept going, there's another hill that's even a good marker. So you just like what we did is, you know, you start at the stop and you see what speed you make it up at the top. Um, you know, we there's a couple hills there that we can use, but it's a good baseline. And then when you go back, you do it again and see the difference. Yeah, so basically how it worked was before we did anything on the coach, I could barely get 25 miles an hour at the top of that hill. And I think I only got one shift. Then after the boost and the exhaust, two shifts, 35 plus, and almost the third shift at the top. After the tune, we got the third shift about halfway through the hill, and we were approaching, we were between 45 and 50 at the top of the hill. That is a, that's an incredible increase in performance. Yeah, yeah, it makes it much more drivable. I, you know, like Bruce likes to say, all I have to do is breathe on the throttle now, and it goes. Where before, you just kind of put your foot to the floor all the time. I mean, and, and you get to kind of think, well, it's that automatic, that thing, you know, it's not the same as, as an auto shift or a manual. And over time, you know, I didn't use it for two years, and then you take it out, and you're like, is this thing getting worse? And it was. My fuel economy was getting worse. Performance was getting worse. But just un, unbelievable amounts of throttle response and fuel now. Like, I had to learn how to drive this thing all over again. Nice, nice. Yeah, so what did what did you guys estimate we might have? We didn't have time to get it on the dyno, but I think we have a pretty rough idea what we're probably pushing, it's right? Yeah, because so yours was five and a quarter from the factory, um, and it's going to be between the 650 and 700, probably a little closer to the 700. It feels like it. It really does. <laughs> it actually feels like it has horsepower now. Yeah, and it was a it was a, it was fun on the test drive. You, you could tell it wasn't just your your factory coach. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and now we have that soft little rumble when it kicks into the third stage of the Jake. And I started noting, I, like, I'll let the Jake roll right down to the intersection and stop, and people look over like, what is that thing? Um, I'm sure most people have never heard one sound like that. No, and it, it puts a smile on your face because it's, it's it not does. obnoxious or anything. It's just, it, it's like, nice, I can hear it now. <laughs> It is, and it's that nice, soft little rumble, and you think, wow, that's uh, that's kind of cool. So uh, you guys did an awesome job, um, and I know some of that stuff is new on a C13, right? Yeah, yeah, some of that is uh, brand new for you there. Nice. So if anybody has a C13 and you're listening, drop what you're doing and drive to Pittsburgh, Saxonburg. Just head there now. You you will be amazed. I've always bragged about the Series 62 and how much I like that. 
this one is much, much better. So I know we don't hear of a lot of C13s, but if you've got one out there, it uh, this engine can run. That's a yeah. nice, uh, nice improvement, that's for sure. Now I'm thinking that I think I'm just going to make this an annual thing that I need to head east for the truck show every year. Uh, I've been hanging out with my family this year, spent some time. That was fun. Spent a week with you guys. But next time I'm thinking, when I pull in there, the first thing I want to do is just tear the bedroom apart. And I can just spend a day doing that myself. And then we'd have access because there's a lot of stuff I'd really like to get at in there. There's stuff that's never been looked at. And again, a lot of people, you know, they put 40,000, 50,000 over the life of the whole coach. I'm at 180. I mean, this thing's more like a working truck. I got to get in there and, and start taking care of some of this stuff. Yeah, and it, it, with the bed access, you'll be able to get to the top, do a little bit better of an inspection, and then do a, even a little bit better of a boost test. And I'm sure it could use an overhead. Oh, how many miles are on it again? 180 from new. So. Yep, it's definitely due. Yeah, but again... It's one of those things. Nobody ever does them because it's just too much work. Nobody feels like they put enough miles on it. But I, I'm just, uh, I think we're just at once a year, I'll just tear the bedroom apart. And, you know, it'll get maintenance once a year, which is better than it's ever had. Yeah. I mean, even if you do it once every two years for the miles that you put on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it needs it now, so... Who knows? Maybe I'll, uh, I don't have any final plans right now, but uh, it could use an overhead. So maybe it's time to just tear the bedroom apart and do an overhead and do a bunch of other stuff, throw a damper on there. And then you're right, I'd probably be good for two years. Yeah, yeah, with the miles that you put on, two years would be more than enough. Yep, yep. So it's uh, kind of exciting. I think there, I could probably travel around the country just doing coaches now um bruce kind of did some of that for a while so much that that we do could help them but it, a lot of times it just does come down to cost can you really recover that cost right now i will say there's so i've put maybe 200 miles on it since i left the shop there has been zero improvement in fuel economy but i know why i'm driving it kind of hard right now I, I want to feel what it'll do, and I'm getting used to it, so I'm kind of pushing it, and, you know, it's kind of fun. But I can already tell that I'm going to predict that I can probably squeeze another full mile per gallon out of this now if I drive it right. Yeah, and that's, again, the same thing I tell everybody who gets a tune the first time, especially if it's a, a fairly spicy one, um, that, hey, give it, you're going to have to need more than two weeks to come up with your fuel economy because – Yes. The first question yeah. I'm going to ask you is, how much fun are you having? And when they smile and they go, I, it's like driving a new truck, all, learning all over again. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to give it a few more weeks here before we uh, worry about the fuel economy there. Enjoyment doesn't always give you the fuel economy. Exactly. So I know that until I kind of head home, you know, on a nice long stretch where I can settle in and drive it the way I normally do, um, but I'm I'm thinking just by what I can see and what I can feel, probably a good solid mile per gallon. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So other than my stuff, what else you got going on? Um, I we've got an interesting project in the shop, and that's the one I, I showed you there that we were putting an N14 in place of a big cam. Um, oh yeah, and I got it was quite yeah, a project. Yep. Yeah, and we've been working at it here lately, and I get the fun job of building a custom wiring harness with the cruise control. I mean, all the other functions are going to function as they should on the truck whenever we're done. Oh, building wiring harnesses. Man, that sounds like fun. Not. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not that it's overly – I don't find it overly hard. It's just time-consuming. You know, it's one of those tedious. things – Right. Yeah, you can't buy what the part you need. It, it doesn't exist out there. Just, yeah, don't even try looking for it. Right. Um, anything you get is going to be some sort of universal thing. It's not going to be quite right. Um, the nice part is we had a donor truck that we had a, a, a N14 came out of. Sadly, we couldn't use that one. But the wiring harness gave me a good base to start with. 
Um, and then comes the fun part of labeling all the wires and <laughs> even got a, a new, a new tool for that one where I can actually print the heat shrink labels and then heat shrink oh, them nice. onto the wires. Yeah. So you can label them because even in the future, take that little extra time now. In the future, if someone ever has to work on this again, well, they won't regret that idea. What a difference that will make, absolutely, to have all of those wires marked like that on the heat shrink itself would be incredible because it'll stay. It's not, you know, like trying to tag things and some of the other stuff. So that, so there, we have a company out in Oregon, and I went down several years ago when we were building gliders. Uh, and talk to them, and they had built some pretty high-end, really kind of specialty gliders. They didn't mess with just, like, high-production, over-the-road trucks. It was, you know, big projects, like really either show trucks or specialized trucks. And their big thing, though, was that they build wiring harnesses. And I went into that operation. It was just incredible. Like, you could kind of custom order You know, I need this engine put in this truck, and um, that's what they did. But that was uh, that was kind of a crazy operation. Yeah, and it takes a a lot of space. You know, I got a whole table dedicated in a cart just to laying it out and what direction I think things are going to go. Later today, I think I'm actually going to test fit it up to the firewall, and that'll give me a good idea before I finalize all the lengths. Um, So it's a fun, slow thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I was also looking around on that truck. There were some, uh, you know, some physical issues with the radiator, charger, cooler setup. I know, um, was it Corey was working on that? Yeah, Corey was working on there. And the nice part is we were going to use the the water to air, but um, the owner there actually found a company that made a radiator and then uh, a charged air cooler that will fit under the hood. Um, So that plan changed a little bit. Yeah, that's where he was struggling a little bit. There was some uh, there was some fabrication that needed to happen to make that all work. Yeah, we're still running into a few other things with defining the right pulley setup um, so that the belts will all go on and run all the accessories. Um, So it's a lot of mix and matching, and oh, you know, some little bit of customization and figuring it out as you go along. So this is a good time. Because every once in a while we get somebody that says, I'm sick of all the problems on this engine. I'm going to yank it out and put a different engine in. And we've tried to discourage most people from attempting that. Um, Unless you're building something like this, a a true project truck where money really isn't a big deal, that you're not trying to get this thing back out on the road and work. Because it, it seems like even if you stay fairly close like you know we're going from a big cam to an n14 those engines existed at the same time you would think that one might be somewhat easy but nothing is it it is just incredible how hard some of these jobs can become yeah a lot of again it's got to be creative when you come across the problems because you're not going to just buy off the shelf parts to that's going to work um then this is probably one of the easier ones. I can only imagine putting a full-blown, uh, like, newer electronic engine in there. Uh, right. Even if you were to put, like, a, a cat in there, you may not have the room um, with the fan set up and everything. That's the thing. You run into now electronic issues, which are really, really time-consuming, and somebody better know what the hell they're doing. But then you still have all those fabrication issues of just making everything fit and connect right. It, just one simple thing. I looked at this, and the the fan clutch was it, there was no room left to fit all that. So now you got to start looking at well, can we move the core forward? Can we get a you know a different fan hub that doesn't stick out so far? But you're right. Where do you go to figure that out? You just got to start uh, looking at parts and getting creative. Yep, look around at other trucks, take some measurements. Hey, that one will work, and then order one. Um, Now, again, it's nice to have a donor truck if you do get this idea uh, because then at least it gives you some baselines like the wiring harness, you know, um, the connectors you might need to use, other parts that you can grab and save a few dollars here and there. Yeah, these these projects seem like they just they take up a bay for a couple weeks to a month sometimes. 
we, probably in realistic, you're looking over a couple months. Wow. Um, the interesting yeah, thing crazy. is I'm, I'm, I'm timing, I'm timing myself here to see how long it takes to build this harness, um, and then wire the dash and everything else. Oh, good. Um, good. So I'm just, I'm curious. So I figured, you know, we're going to keep track of it all and then see what it actually takes just to wire one of these. Excellent. All right. Well, I think, uh. I think we should probably bring Pete into the conversation. Pete, we didn't forget about you. It's just uh, you had a lot to talk about there. Welcome back. Hi, Kevin. How are you doing today? Doing good. It was great to hang out with you guys. I had a uh, had a great time living in your garage, and I left with a big smile on my face. And uh, we're going to have to do more of that. Yeah, we got a lot accomplished, and that's nice when a truck or any vehicle comes in and you you find a problem, and yeah. Yeah. Be able to correct it and, and and find the solution to it, not just throw fuel to it um, and, and do it right. And I think, you know, now that you played with it on the, uh, you know, uh, way back home or back to Ohio, you know, when you are done to show, you know, try to get some fuel mileage and see what you get. And I, I just can't imagine it not jumping up quite a bit just because of the restriction you had. I mean, he said night and day difference just from the boost leak and the muffler alone, right. which is correcting yep. a problem. And, of course, yeah. the updated tune really was the um, icing on a cake, getting that uh, upgraded. <laughs> yeah, it was. yeah, it was. So let's go back to that boost leak. Somebody, I think on our forum, actually said that that's a common issue on that engine. And there, it's, I think they talked about the fact that they're, they put them back together wrong and it actually creates that boost leak. So I don't know if mine was ever taken apart. My guess is it wasn't. That would have been factory. Very possible. And, you know, we did a lot of the Dodge pickups with the 5.9s years ago, and we would get fairly new trucks in with a boost leak. And they had a, a, a rash of Dodges that came in. The pipe that went from the air-to-air which would be on the driver's side to the engine, down at the air to air itself was off. It, like it, it wasn't shoved on properly, and they all had boost leaks. I mean, literally brand new trucks would have boost leaks. And how many people would think to check, hey, it's a new truck, yep. we should still check it. Yeah, and right. that's why what? we do it all the time. I, I'll even have guys say, hey, I just had it checked. I'm like, yeah, but you know, it wasn't two days ago. You know, if you didn't have a check two days ago, plus I don't trust someone else's <laughs> testing. Are they doing well, a smoke too. test? Right. Are they testing the whole thing, um, not just the air-to-air? You know, we see that a lot. And then especially with the A-certs, um, where we find a lot of boost leaks is between the turbos. Right. That, that's a common place. It is hard when you assemble them. Um, there's these accordion things that uh, crack from age. Right. Uh, and that's where the smoke test is nice because you can see it. Because uh, sometimes you, you can't get your hands back there. A lot of it, the engines, you can listen and feel around for a leak. Uh, with the A search, you can't. And the smoke machine just makes that job so much easier. Yeah, so another good lesson if you've got one of the A search, get the smoke test done. That does seem to be a common, common place. And I have a feeling that <clears throat> that boost leak's probably been there since this was built. It looks like, and I see this on other engines, where instead of bolting the part to the engine and then, you know, clamping the, the hoses down, people will, because it's easier, get the clamps done first. And then you're forced to kind of use the bolts to draw in the part. Right. And, you know, it doesn't fit right. The O-ring moves. Uh, I've seen that somewhat frequently. People seem to go that method and not bolt the part first, and then tighten the clamps once everything's where it needs to be positioned. Right, right. So, all right, uh, what else you got going on? We're just getting ready for the truck show. We'll be heading out today um, sometime this this afternoon, and we normally drive partway down, spend the night, and that way we get there early enough to set up. We've got a big booth, a lot to set up, so that we're not, uh, you know, working there all night setting up. 
Yeah. Those are which, plans, gathering all the stuff. Uh, and a, little, and a little rusty. I haven't done a show for a couple of years. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, uh, you know, it's hard enough when you only do a couple shows a year to remember all that stuff, and then you finally kind of get a system down, but then not doing it for two years is going to be like starting over almost. Yeah, when we were doing them on a regular basis, it was once you got the one set up, everyone pretty much fell the same way. Uh, now we're not, right. you know, besides not doing them, and we do the truckers, Jamboree at uh, Walcott, but it's an outdoor show, so you know we carry different stuff. So yes. you know, when Got I would it. do this show, I'd take the stuff out and bring the the, the canopy um, and not the and the, no carpeting stuff like that. So you're moving stuff back and forth. But yeah, this show is like okay. I hope I have everything because I haven't done one for a while. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's uh, this show seems really, really uh, well attended again this year. I know I waited. Uh, actually, I waited too long because I didn't know what my plans were going to be, so I'm not even on site. I, it, and normally, I'm right there in the RV park. And in my mind, I was actually thinking this year that I was going to go over to Papa John's and park over there. And I even thought, you know, I'll do my show in the morning and I could set the um, – I have a PA system I could set outside if people wanted to sit outside and listen. And then when I went to look, they don't allow any RVs at all in that lot trucks only so then i kind of had to scramble and i found a place but uh not normally i wake up roll out of bed get in the shower and walk into the building you know i'm a hundred yards away usually but uh not this year and it seems to me like it's probably going to be well attended which is a good thing i i think so we we haven't had a show for quite a while a big show anyhow there's been a lot of outdoor shows so i i think people are going to be looking forward to the show again everyone's getting out the weather's starting to get mild uh, i i think it's gonna be we're gonna be crazy busy there yeah good which is why uh, we do the shows do, yeah do we know if we if bruce is joining us today and when he he is he said he was going to be a little bit late okay but he has the number to call got it all right so uh i think we're gonna grab some calls let's uh We've got lines open if you want to jump in right now, 855-950-3835. We're going to head off to Oklahoma. Ken, welcome to the program. Well, good morning, guys. Good to hear you back on the whatever. So I get you anyway. Good. Uh, Good. I'm listening all about your, been watching with interest about your, your coach and the C-13. I run a C-13. Is yours a KCB by chance? Uh, Ethan, did you happen to get that? Yeah, one? yeah, it's a KCB. KCB. Okay, okay. So okay. Same thing I got, but I don't have the coach to deal with. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious, at, at 700 horsepower, how long is that C-13 going to last? Forever. Because now I can drive it so much easier than I used to. Yeah, Bruce has been saying this for years, and and it's true. You give somebody a really well-tuned engine, and even if it's hot, if you drive it right, it will extend the life, just like it improves fuel economy if you drive it right. Now, the opposite can happen. If I I go around, you know, with my foot on the floor and – you know, racing from stop sign to stop sign so I can hear the Jake again and, you know, trying to beat everybody to the top of the hill. Um, Yeah, I'd probably end up taking some life off of it. But if I really drive it where I'm barely touching the throttle anymore to accelerate, um, my guess is I'm going to extend the life. I understand the theory about that with the N14 or a C15 or even of Detroit, which is a fairly robustly built engine, but to me, I mean, my C13 is just a rattle the ass. You know, it just does, it's not a very awe-inspiring engine. As well, far it not is not mine is driving it and, and the power way. The way it sounds, it just sounds you know like an old L10 or M11 Cummins. You know, it doesn't sound like a truck engine. It sounds a lot smaller, a lot lighter. I just and it is a lot. I mean, a 127 Detroit outweighs the C13 by quite a bit, although, you know, the 127 is virtually the same size. Why? I, I just, I don't know. Is there enough Is there enough beef in the block and all the whole the power is my Well, question. here's, let's say that it is lighter architecture. One of the reasons we don't 
really have good numbers on C-13s. There's just not a lot of them out there in trucks, I don't think. I, right. I very seldom get calls about them. So, you know, with the Detroit, we could tell you, oh, yeah, take care of them. They go to 1.3 constantly. You know, with N-14s, they run forever. We had enough of those to know. I, I honestly don't know what I should expect out of this, but it doesn't matter. I'll never reach it, not not in this right. It, it, in Right. In your application, I'm at 2 million on my truck here, and I just got over a million, 15,000 on the overhaul now, so. That's the second one. Okay. A million fifteen thousand on the first one. Yes, sir. You're talking about the C13. You have that kind of miles on. Yes, sir. And you're asking me how robust it is. Sounds like it's pretty damn robust. He answered his uh, own question. And, and uh, you know what? I, I'm a pretty gentle driver. I've got a lot of friends that you know know people that, that nobody's heard of one going the kind of miles I've got. So what? Well, I that's mean, kind of my I, point, I tend though. to take better care of stuff than most people do. So here's another thing. Let's say we look at the average life of an N14 or a, any engine. Most of our numbers are going to be com coming from fleet drivers. So that's going to pull the yeah. average down. Most of them don't drive like this. You've got a lot of students in those trucks. But you actually right. just kind of made our point that, if you drive these things right, you can make them really last. If you maintain them right, if you spec them right. And now the more horsepower and torque, I believe, gives drivers like you and I more life out of these engines, not less. Okay. Uh, I don't even know if I can word my next question correctly or make you understand it, a question for the guys. But I – okay, you're – putting out 700 horsepower if you want to, but you're normally going to run around using 430 horsepower, say. No, so no hold on. I, I can give you some numbers on that because I track it. Very seldom, and especially now, very seldom am I, am I exceeding anywhere near even 300 horsepower. I'm running around using okay. about 250 most of the time. Okay, let, but let me ask my question. Uh Okay, now you, you you used to have a 525 horsepower engine and using 250 horsepower, and I understand you had the boost leak, you have problems with it. Uh, well, I, hold, my hold question, on. I, okay, finish your question, but I want to make sure I don't forget my thoughts. So go ahead, I'll make a note. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can word it correctly. Uh, a 700 horsepower engine putting out 250 horsepower is working less hard than my. 430 horsepower engine putting out 250 horsepower. It seems to me like the piston is pushing down on the rod, is pushing down on the crankshaft, is just as hard at 250 horsepower. So, I, I I don't understand the science behind where you're going there. I'm not this, so not this again. I'm saying I don't understand it. No, no, I, and hopefully we can explain it. We've got Bruce. I'm going to bring him in in a minute. He can probably help us with this. But let's Let's take a look at mine, and I know I had some other issues that were big issues, but trucks run around with these same issues all the time. So really oh, yeah, I, I just, just found it, them on mine. Yeah, when I was at 525 Factory, I was probably not being able to use 250. I was probably using more like 350, but – the engine was trying to put out that much horsepower, but now you right. think about it, it had a massive boost leak, so we're not getting good combustion. We had tons of back pressure, so the engine is working like hell, but none of that power is making it to my wheels. I understand that, but my question is totally stock 430 like mine is now. We just fixed the boost leak. Got it. It's running great. Uh, for a 430 stock, but I don't understand how us doing the same work with them, yours is getting an easier life than mine when we're doing virtually the same output of horsepower is my question. So, I, yeah, so let's look at a couple things that would be different. And, again, I'm going to bring Bruce in because the three of them can probably explain this better than right. I can. But here's something else to think about. Now my – throttle position sensor, which I actually watch on the dash, before right. I was, you know, I was using a lot of that throttle. 
a lot. Right. And now I'm hardly using any throttle. I mean, in the throttle position sensor, the difference is big. I I, I understand that, but so it still seems to me like the load on the crankshaft is just as hard as it was before. So, I don't know. Okay, and you might be right, but how often do we lose engines over crankshafts? Almost never. So who cares? No, I, so I, putting, I'm just saying the twisting for all of the forces inside the engine at 250, well, whether... Let's let's think about that's this. That's where my mind doesn't and, grasp it. Yeah, and let's think about this, and these guys will correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to me like now, let's say we're going to compare them factory and new and with the tune, and we're going to look at what happens when they're both producing, let's say, 300 horsepower going down the road. I, I I believe now, because of the tune, forget the other stuff that helped, but the tune alone... Uh, Ethan, correct me, am I wrong? Are are we using more fuel at that point or maybe less fuel at that point because we're burning it more efficiently? So we'll say we'll pick a horsepower like about 300 um, since, you know, each engine is going to operate there quite consistently. So with the timing and fueling changes we've adjusted a little bit and how the fuel comes on, you should be using a little bit less, hence the efficiency is up. That was my okay. thought. So now, even at the same horsepower, it takes less fuel to create it. Less fuel means everything on that engine is easier. The more fuel you keep piling into an engine to get some performance out of it, the more soot you create from not burning it completely. That's when you actually start to create some of those problems. But when you can create that same amount of horsepower more efficiently, it now becomes easier on the engine, not harder. Right. Okay. I say, I'm not arguing the point. I'm just no, saying no, my mind can't I, grasp the point. No, this is a good conversation. People learn from this. We all learn from this. I'll probably end up learning something from Bruce and Pete and Ethan if we talk about this. So I think this is this is a great conversation to have. So how will the tune be different than my Pittsburgh power box I have that has not been hooked up for many years because I didn't like what it did to the engine? Ethan, so that would be the, yours. The tune and the power box have one big difference. The power box modifies the injection signal after the ECM already sends it to the injectors. So the ECM is unaware of what's going on. Where the tune, you know, we've physically changed the parameters in the ECM, so the ECM is actually aware of it and knows what changes, you know, exactly when the fuel is going to be going, how much fuel is going into the engine, where the power box extends the signal after the fact. Okay. I understand that. That, that makes perfect sense. So let's do this. Um, <clears throat> Ken, do you want to hang with us while I uh, bring Bruce in? Certainly. Okay. All right. If you think my call is worthy of it, sure. Of course it is. Yeah. Let's, uh, Bruce, welcome back. Well, thank you. I'm on my way into the chiropractor, but I have 15 minutes, and then I'll be gone for half hour, and then I'll be back. But let me okay. say this. In 45 years – Keep in mind, when I got started with engines, we had NH250s. We had 270s, 335s. If you had a 350, you had a big hammer. But they all worked hard. And I would go into the local Caterpillar dealer. It was Beckwith at the time because they had the dyno. They had the only dyno in our area. And I would see stock 3406B 350 engines sitting on the floor with broken cranks, burnt exhaust manifolds. I didn't have these problems with the big cams once we gave them power and gave them air. Now, I don't know if those cats were company trucks or owner-operator trucks, but every time we made a person happy with how their truck ran, many things happened in your attitude towards the truck changes. But when you see the rolling hill up ahead of you and you just ease into that throttle, and it, like you see, it only takes a quarter inch, quarter inch. And let's say you're cruising along at eight or 10 pound of boost and you know you need 24 to go over that hill 
a quarter inch of throttle will take you right up to 24 pounds. But if it's stock, you got to almost push it to the floor to get that 24 pounds. And now it just dances up into the hill and over the hill and away you go. And you you make your fuel mileage going downhill and on the level, not going up. So the easier you get over the hill, the better your fuel mileage. And we have always seen that engines live longer when the driver loves it or the owner loves it, and he maintains it and drives it properly. Uh, years ago, we would take an engine and give it an extra uh, several hundred horsepower, and I'd think, oh, boy, this guy, this guy's not going to live. This engine is in trouble. <laughs> But guess what? Half a million miles go by, the guy comes back, would set the overhead off, oh, still running great. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. This guy used to be a hammerhead, or, and uh, now he's not because he has something that responds to him. And it just changes your whole attitude, changes your whole day. You know, there was a there was a song, Life's Too Short to Dance with Ugly Women. I changed it. I said, Life's Too Short to Drive a Weak Truck. <laughs> There's another Anytime. song that says that you want to be happy for the rest of your life. Get an ugly woman to be your wife, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I listen to yeah. that song too because she's a great cook. Well, no, maybe back to I, that. I can tell you if you if you have no matter what it is, I don't care if it's a chainsaw. If it doesn't run right, it gets abused. And anything that doesn't work right, if you buy a piece of tool or equipment and it doesn't work right, it gets abused. But if what you're using makes you happy, then it lasts a long time. I, I, What's it? I think I remember a story you told one time about somebody brought something like a 290 into you that was kind of on its last legs and had to turn it up. Said, you know, let, let it go out in a blaze of glory. And then you had said, man, I never saw him and never saw him. And you said, man, the thing, when you saw him again, he said, the thing's just running so good. It doesn't need to come in and be overhauled it. You're exactly right, and that's exactly what I said. I mean, this guy came in, this 290 was wore out. And he, uh, back then, you know, we did a lot of steel, Pittsburgh to Chicago, Chicago back to the butt company in Philadelphia. And I said, well, let's just crank the hell out of this thing and give it all the fuel we can. And apparently it must have blown all the soot that was around the rings and in the ringlands because – he never come back for the rebuild. Uh, I remember, I've been listening for a while. I listen. I don't yeah. just hear yeah. it and go on. I, I listen. So. But that was exactly what I said. Let's let this 290 go down in glory. That, hey, hey Grace, up on the, yes. We, we only got you for 15 minutes, and I don't want to forget this later, even if we get you back. When you don't have 500,000 miles on a damper, but you have – it's old. What what was the time you said to replace it? Ten years. Ten. So mine's yeah, we, fifteen. We've taken them. Yeah, yours needs replaced. Yeah, that's what I thought. Only one hundred eighty thousand miles, but it's just old. We took one off a of D deck four and a day cab Pete, and all this truck did was uh, haul asphalt equipment around Winston Salem, North Carolina. They had one hundred forty six thousand miles when he came into our shop. We did a lot of work to it. Now, I here's the good news. What? The crankshaft damper might be the easiest thing to work on on this engine. I should be able to knock that out myself. It's about the only That's thing right. on the engine you can it, actually get to. It's not hard That's to right. do. I've done mine many times. So. Yeah, it's, 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 it's right there. Bring them a damper and balance right right to the show. I can do that. We'll have awesome. Pete bring you a damper and balancer. But, hey, this uh, – this 146,000 miles on this uh, D-Deck 4 Detroit, um, I, I talked to him. I said, you know, this thing's way over 10 years old, even though there's no miles on it. And I said, uh, with another 300, at the time, the dampers were $348 for that engine. I said, uh, could you go another 348 He said, absolutely. And we did that, and we went for a ride. We're going up Route 80. He said, oh, my God, my shifter doesn't rattle. My steering wheel's smooth. He said, my arm used to get tired. I held back so tight on that shifter. It wore my arm out because I couldn't stand the rattling. That was the damper. The damper had 146,000 on it. Yeah. Well, here's the thing in this. 
you, I, I won't notice a difference. That engine's so far away from you, you can't feel any of that. But I got thinking about it. That doesn't mean it's not back there pounding on the engine more than it should be. That's right. That's exactly right. So, Kevin, are you in Louisville with the coach? Uh, not yet. I am still sitting out in the woods uh, on the lake that I grew up skiing on. Oh, so you didn't even get to drive it to Louisville and feel those rolling hills going down. No, not yet. One. No, I only okay. got, uh, I've put about 200 miles on it running between there and here. And then I've been running around locally a little bit. And <clears throat> You know, it happens locally, like, you know, stop and start and turning a lot more. I, I at, I'm already starting, but I had to really get used to it. I found myself braking really hard all of a sudden. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I, like, I'm getting to the turn, and I'm like, well, slow down. I, and I kept thinking, why am I I'm like almost overrunning every stop, and I'm getting on the brakes hard? And that's not like me. I'm usually easy on the throttle, easy on the brake. Well, I still feel like I'm easy on the throttle, but I'm not easy enough. I mean, there, there's just that much power there that even – a third of the throttle is too much when I used to accelerate with three quarters of the throttle. Yeah. It, it's just, it, it's just running so free. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of that had to do with that muffler. So if I don't adjust my driving habits, I'm going to be doing a brake job on it pretty soon. Mm-hmm. A free running vehicle is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It is. So, so Ken, does all that help? It does help. I have one more question, if I may, more about etiquette sure. than anything. Uh, I'm coming due for, a, you know, I'll, I'll be needing my second overhaul on this thing sometime soon, and I don't have a machine shop around me that will balance the stuff. Is it ethically feasible to, you know, get parts from you that are balanced and then have them put it in my shop because I have a wonderful working relationship at my shop where I typically work on the truck myself? Yes, yes, we can do that for you. And my next magazine article, uh, I found an old article about what so many ounces at so many RPM, how m much force that puts on the connecting rod when it's out of balance. And it's kind of shocking. Well, and who knows what this thing has in it for pistons. We broke them all down one at a time and looked at them before we put it together. But we were never comparing piston against piston. I just was reading a post on Facebook where somebody said between his lightest and heaviest piston pack was two pounds difference. And yeah. this truck is, it, I mean, the original engine, the rebuilt, you know, after we rebuilt it, it's always vibrated. It's a rattling yeah. ass cab and stuff. And I'd like to get, what, what do I do? Just uh, have you get a platinum kit for me and balance it and then ship it to my shop? I think it would be better, being we're not a cat dealer, for you to get buy your kit, send us the cylinder packs, and we'll send gotcha. them back to you. They will and not be. Know. They won't be put back in the liners. So you'll you'll put the uh, rods and the pistons and the rings on and put the liners in and then drop it that way, the way you should do an engine. I don't I don't like taking a cylinder pack out of a box and dropping that down in because you don't know if you have six pistons at match. Right. We, like I say, we we looked at each one and looked at the ring installation on them, make sure there were none upside down or anything, but we didn't have them. You know, we did them one at a time. We didn't have them yeah. all six out together, so that was a mistake. But, I mean, the kid that built this one in the shop there did a beautiful job. It's a lot better engine in its second incarnation than it was as Caterpillar built it. And okay. here I am. I'm, I'm at a million and 15,000 miles on it, and I just went 17,000 miles before I had to put a gallon of oil in it. I got 240,000 wow. miles on my oil. So Nice. Hey, I um, have to run. I'll talk to you okay. in a half hour. Bye-bye. All right. We will talk okay, to you I can let you go and get... And, Ken, we're going to cut you loose. Great stuff. I, uh, I like those extended conversations without breaks. I do have to say, though, uh, we're coming up at the top of the hour. So at the top of the hour, I will, uh, I will say goodbye to our listeners on TNCRadio.live. We are going to continue the power hour 
Um, so if you want to, you could head on over to letstruck.com and listen to the second hour of the program. We, uh, we're going to get back to the calls. It's time to talk to uh, Mike in California. Hey, Mike, I, I might have to uh, jump in and interrupt the call right at the top to say goodbye to the listeners, and uh, then we'll continue on. So uh, what can we help you with today? Uh-oh. What just happened? Oh, we lost Mike. He's been there forever. What a, ah, I don't know how we lost that call. Let's go to uh, Mark in Arizona. Welcome. What can we help you with today? Oh, why are we not hearing callers? Uh, when that happens two times, uh, and we not only do we not hear them, they're dropping. Um, where is my where's my call screener? Uh oh, something weird's going on. My call screener's gone. Oh, I'm gone. I'm not on the board anymore. What's happening? Yes, I am. I'm on the board. Pete, Nathan, can you guys hear me? I can hear you, Kevin. I can hear you. Okay. So that was weird. Um, Okay, now Angie's back. And Angie, don't freak out. I'm just going to bring you on air for a second. Angie? Angie? Hello, Angie? For some reason, no. And now we just lost our screener again. We may actually have to wrap this up, guys. Um, Yeah, we may have found a, a weak link in our technology somewhere that hasn't shown. Let me just... Try grabbing one more. I still have calls on the board. Let's see if I can, if anybody can hear me. Um, Did somebody just hear a beep calling from 406? Anybody? I'm still here, but I didn't hear anything, Kevin. Yeah, I, it seems like when I bring a call on, they can't hear me and then the call just drops. And I'm also watching my call screeners now trying for the third time to get back in. Sounds like we are, uh, we're having an issue. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this up at the top. Um, every time we find an issue, I want to dig right in and figure out what it is and how do we avoid this in the future. So I could probably just restart the show and we could come back and do another hour. But when I find a problem right now, it's the whole point behind what we're doing try to work all these out. So I think I'm just going to uh, wrap this up. we got about two minutes. Pete, Ethan, anything you guys want to end with? Well, Kevin, we were talking about that C13, and I think you know it's just an overlooked engine because everyone went with the C15. You know, really not seeing I, problems with that engine. It's just that there wasn't many out there. You know, I always said I liked the C12 prior to the ACERT. I thought the Mm -hmm. C12 was an overlooked engine that we should have used a lot more. And then I kind of ignored the C13 because of the ACERT stuff and we didn't know enough about it. But I think you're right. I think this may turn out like the bridge, um, that this is a really, really good engine once you learn how to set them up right. I agree. I agree. And you can... um you know, relate to that now that you're seeing how well yours run. And I don't think you would have thought that no. you know, a few years back. No. Well, I said I don't like this engine. I, I, it's my only experience with one, and honestly, I don't like it. it. The performance was awful. The fuel mileage was awful. All I could say was it never breaks. Um, I've, I've never had to, like, fix anything on the engine. It starts all the time. It runs fine. But I was I didn't like it. Now I went from not liking it to I love this thing. Like, I would love to have a Class A truck with one of these built like this and see what it does. I think we'd be impressed. All right, um, Ethan, sorry. Uh, I said you can have a last word, but we're just about out of time. So uh, we'll see you guys at the truck show in just a a day or two. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Stop into Louisville. The Pittsburgh Power Booth is going to be the place to be. We will see you back here tomorrow.
I'm Kevin Rutherford.